Cool. Well, I'm ready whenever you are. Hi everyone, it's Brian Waters here from the YouTube. Thanks for joining us this evening or this morning or the middle of the night, whatever it is where you are. I know that we've got some people in crazy selection of time zones. I know there was one guy in Australia that was hoping to tune in, but it was something like, I don't know, 1 a.m. or 3 a.m. for him. But anyway, the masterclass will be on uh, our YouTube channel after um, we finished. It'll stay on the channel so you can watch it at your leisure and rewatch it as many times as you like. So I'm really delighted to introduce this, our second um, live streamed masterclass with Mike Ladisser. Uh, we did the first one about two months ago, I think, Mike, yeah? Mm -hmm. About yeah, two November. months ago, uh, which was great. And so we're doing a follow-up today. And just like last time, we're gonna have a question and answer session at the end. Um, so that'll be an opportunity for you to put questions to Mike. And you can fire the questions into the chat at any time. Uh, if they're sort of relevant to what's happening right now on the masterclass, then I'll try to get Mike to address them. Uh, but if they're general questions, then we'll probably save them and try to get to them at the end. Uh, if I do miss your question, feel free to type it again. I'll do my best to keep up with the, the live chat. Um, so yeah, good to see so many of you ready to watch. 45 of you at the moment, that's, that's really pleasing. I know you're not here to see me, so... Um, Without further ado, I'll hand over to Mike. Well, thanks, Brian. Um, I'm excited to be back. I'm excited to do this uh, follow-up. It was something that Brian and I kind of chatted about after the last one, just because we had so many extra questions. Um, and I thought it's actually a unique opportunity to just sort of follow through the project um, that I was spotting in the last masterclass. So if you're just tuning into this one, um, feel free to check out the previous one. This will be a kind of continuation of it. Um, and yeah, we've got this clip I'm going to kind of walk you through tonight. And essentially the format of tonight, I'm just going to do, I'll show you what I've done and then do a sort of full breakdown um, through the whole kind of thought and writing process of, of how I got to where it is. Um, I was thinking real quick, Brian, would you want to mention something just about the uh, charity partner and score relief just as we're kind of getting started? We'll be kind of chatting about this, I think, a couple of times tonight. Uh, but a big part of sort of what we're doing for this uh, month is focusing on um, the score relief and uh, this whole push. So obviously, Brian's the expert on this more than me. Hi, I'm back. Just when you thought you got rid of me. Um, yeah, so obviously at the moment we're running score relief, our second one. Um, which is a free film scoring contest with amazing prizes. Uh, most of you probably know about it, but the main prizes I suppose that are gonna excite people are, um, see I'm so excited I knocked my microphone off. Uh, you can have your piece of music performed by Northern Film Orchestra. Um, there is a one-to-one -one session with Carlos Rafael Rivera who composed for The Queen's Gambit amongst other things. Uh, there's some fantastic sound libraries, uh, Mike's Mike's been very generous in donating uh, a place on his film academy as one of the prizes along with a one-to-one -one session with Mike. So there's lots of great prizes. It's completely free to enter. It's running to the end of this month. And uh, one of the main reasons that we do score relief as well as to create a great opportunity for the community is to try to do something good, something charitable. And we're working alongside a charity called In Place of War this year who do fantastic work to sort of regenerate cultural activities in communities which have been sort of devastated by war and other types of conflict. So they find grassroots projects that perhaps don't have the resources that they need in terms of knowledge, education, you know, physical resources, and they, and they try and support them and help them as much as they can. So it's a fantastic um, charity and uh, I'm really excited to partner with them for Score Relief this year. So I'd encourage you, if you can, to take part in the contest. Uh, there's a nice animation to score, and there's also a dramatic um, sort of, what do they call it, spoken word piece uh, to score, if you prefer that style. And uh, yeah, if you can, uh, donate to our charity fundraiser. Uh, invite all your friends, family, colleagues, employers, and everybody to contribute. And uh, yeah, good luck to everyone that's taken part. Uh, so I'll hopefully, that's all you'll hear from me for a while. Take care and enjoy the masterclass, everyone. Over to you, Mike. Cool. I, uh, I won't put you on the spot again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's absolutely fine. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a great charity partner too, because um, I, for me, I think something that's really important is just 
when there's a, a really actionable cause, like if it's a difference of sort of putting an instrument in someone's hand or not, you know, I can think those uh, really make a difference in people's lives. So, um, so I'm happy to support it this month as well. Any sales of my course, 10% of that is going to go to support in place of war as well. Um, so really, you know, excited for that. Um, so let's kind of jump in a little bit. Um, I think first off, uh, what I'll do is I'm just going to play through the finished clip. Um, and then we can start to kind of backtrack through that. Um, so tonight I've got, um, a few different sort of versions and, uh, ideas and things like that, that I'll be showing through. Um, and so I think let's just start off kind of right from the top with the, the full thing. So we can sort of get an idea of where we're headed. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen over. Um, I'm running just out of logic tonight for playback just because it'll be a lot more stable. Um, Cubase is notoriously buggy with Zoom. Uh, so anyway, let's just double check. This is the correct version and should be good to go. Cool. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, so obviously there's quite a lot of details and uh, a lot of stuff in here, um, but I want to talk through, um, as I said, a kind of continuation on where I left off in the last one, which was uh, where we had gone through and spotted the project. Um, so when I went through, I Kind of thought, you know, initially just watching the film, there was a few different sections uh, that I would need and a few different kind of bits of music that I knew uh, would be necessary for it. So um, one thing that sort of jumped out at me initially was the very ending of it. Um, I'll just share my screen back so I can kind of scrub through the film a little bit um, as I chat. So I knew that sort of this section to the end, it sort of jumped out at me as 
this was a place where um, music had the most to say. Um, so as I was sort of discussing it in the last masterclass, I talked about it in terms of kind of the percentage of the screen uh, that music would take up. And so at the end here, music was really going to be sort of telling us the story, it would be sort of the lead character kind of in the ending. Because um, otherwise, we're just watching them have a little snack as opposed to all the other action and bits that we saw throughout. So I thought this is a good place for me to kind of think about what my actual theme might be. Um, and then away from picture, I came up with uh, just kind of what my initial theme was. So I spent some time and sat down and uh, just at the piano and just wanted to really understand kind of what's sort of the lead sheet, um, you know, of this. What is my main melody and harmony and things that I'm going to be kind of working with? Um, so this is what I came up with uh, just as the, the sort of base theme that I'd use. So with that, I knew, okay, now I can, uh, once I've established that, I have this sort of vocabulary that I can start to work with. Um, and just quickly kind of about, you know, what did I do to sort of come up with this? Um, really, I just thought about this sort of final moment um, or this final sequence here in the film. Um, and th this is really what it was about. You know, this character, the caribou is... Um, looking to, uh, you know, get these berries, but is also lonely. And that's the thing that we sort of see at the end, you know, sort of being uh, left on their own. So this kind of uh, theme, I wanted to sort of demonstrate like a sense of family, something that was quite warm. Um, and, you know, that sort of helped dictate when I was imagining this scene while sort of composing that it helped dictate the kind of tempo and the sort of mood and the harmonic language and that kind of stuff a bit. So I knew that was really sort of the crux. This was the main point of the whole film. So that's what the theme should be around. Um, so once I had that, then I started to come up with a couple other smaller themes and stuff. Um, so I knew I was going to need something that was a bit more kind of curious. Um, and I'll show you my, you know, very initial theme of that, uh, which is just coming up with this simple idea based off of those first three notes in the melody. So this is really it. You know, this is just something, it's really a placeholder. Um, so I'm going to just open up, um, I've got behind this, I've got the Cubase session, um, just so I can look through a bit of the MIDI here. I've got these, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Brian, what were you saying? Oh yeah, sorry, Brian's just telling me something, guys. So <laughs> he, he tells me that you can't hear him, but uh, I can. So sure thing. Yeah. Uh, so sorry, Brian just told me there was a bit of a glitch and maybe uh, the stream got out of sync. So I'm happy to play through it a bit. Um, we can watch it through again. I think, you know, some of these things are just streaming through Zoom and then uh, on through. So these are some of the, you know, uh, realities of the tech. Um, so I'll just um, show you quickly kind of on this point. Um, here I have sort of a basic layout. I started to arrange the strings a little bit, but this is kind of my initial piano idea. Um, and this is just what I've got kind of in the key editor as my main theme. 
So I wanted to have this laid out in a very simple structure for me to be able to kind of build off of. So then these three notes essentially became the pizzicato uh, idea. So that's this one here. And I'm just sequencing it. I'm just kind of playing around with this and um, no, okay, this needs a lot of development, but it's a very basic idea. It's that kind of feeling. So it's more or less telling me, I think I'm on to something. Then I also took this and I put it in D minor and um, I started to play with this as more of a figure to create something that's a bit more kind of uh, action-y. So I knew I was going to need a few different bits of action music for this. The first part is when the train is coming and the um, baby penguins on the tracks. And then the second bit is when they're in the rail car kind of going through the mine. Um, so I knew I was going to need some variations on some kind of action music uh, for those, those bits. So this was my very initial idea of that, which is, again, just sort of taking this as a figure and turning it into a texture. Um, so instead of relying it on just as a melody, I have a texture that I can use for that. So I'm just going to play through that idea as well. So something very simple. Um, again, it's kind of a placeholder, but that gives me something to start working with. Um, I'll take the opportunity now. We can just have another playthrough. Um, if you'd like, it's also on my YouTube channel. Um, so you can go check out my YouTube channel. I uploaded it yesterday, so you can watch the full thing there. And then you'll get the uh, higher quality audio So because uh, it's not coming through the stream. So feel free to check that out anytime as well. Um, if it, you know, keeps glitching or something like that, uh, we have that. So I'll just give another playthrough of this.
Cool. Um, so I want to show you kind of where I went to next. I hope that was a bit better um, if there was major sync issues last time. Um, it also may vary depending on uh, certain people might be receiving the stream slightly differently. Uh, but as I said, you can check out the uh, full version on my YouTube channel just to hear it uh, totally in sync. Um, so when I've got these initial ideas for something like this, because the film is quite short, it's two minutes and 40 seconds, two minutes, 42 or so. Um, I don't need to come up with a five minute suite of all of these ideas fleshed out because it would be a lot of stuff that I won't end up using. I really just need some kind of bits and pieces that I can start to use in order to kind of temp this out. Um, and this is exactly what I go through in my uh, online course is essentially this process, coming up with the themes and suites first, then using these basic ideas, temping out a project, using that as a framework, uh, and then starting to kind of fill in the details. Um, something that I sort of thought of as a really uh, relevant analogy is uh, this meme that most of you have probably seen. Um, so of this unfinished horse. So the first bit is really how I feel when I'm sort of starting the project. Um, so I'm kind of, I know I'm putting in ideas that don't fully work, uh, but they're kind of a placeholder. It's just something that's a bit of a guide. And then I gradually make my way over to here where I feel like I've really filled in all the details and have everything laid out. Um, so this is what it felt like to me kind of throughout the process of this. All in all, this uh, probably took me about maybe three days or so of uh, work. I was doing kind of in bits and pieces, you know, a couple hours in an evening here or there. Um, but uh that's sort of what that, that process sort of felt like is slowly kind of getting there and carving away. Um, so one thing that I thought might be interesting to kind of show is this kind of middle ground area. Um, so what I've got is instead of the finished version, I've got this sort of intermediary version. Um, and from here, this is where I've essentially roughly kind of mapped out a few of those ideas and sort of put it into place. So you'll hear stuff that is clearly just a bit of a loop, some stuff that, uh, you know, is a very basic kind of arrangement. Um, so I've taken kind of this ending was a little bit more, it was easier for me to sort of flesh out a bit, but it's mostly just sort of piano and strings. Uh, the beginning here, I started to go through this pits idea and develop it into something uh, more or less what I ended up with, this kind of rhythmic idea. Um, and then I'm just using that as a placeholder in different spots. Um, I also had a, a different sense of what the kind of action music might be um, as I was going through. So I'm going to play through this version now, which is sort of the temp track. This is essentially the version after I've taken those ideas, put them into something that was a little bit more usable um, and then created sort of just like a first draft of let me have music from start to finish.
Sorry, I think I was muted. Um, so Brian was telling me there was a couple of questions about Mickey Mousing through the score. Um, I think I'll be able to address that a little bit more specifically as I get into the details in a little bit. Um, but because there is um, sort of times to pay attention to that and other times where they sort of happen uh, because our brain is making the connection rather than me sort of specifically pointing out, you know, this moment versus that moment. Um, so it's a, it's a good kind of topic of discussion though. Uh, and it's something that kind of, I, I get quite a lot with something like this. So, um, I just want to talk through some of these. I'm going to mute the backing track. Um, so we have just the music here and talk through a few points here of where I'm kind of mapping it out. So I knew there was this kind of rhythmic thing that I'd be doing. So this just gave me something that I felt like that was uh, really more or less the kind of pace and, um, you know, had to create a sort of rhythmic idea. This was almost like my secondary kind of uh, action music idea uh, beyond this uh, one that I showed you with the staccato strings here. Um, I'll show you what I ended up getting into, though, is in the final we had... Um, I was using a lot more, uh, I was sort of playing into this train a lot more. Uh, so I'll play through this and you can hear, I've really got it driving kind of with a snare drum. And this is typical, uh, you know, more or less like sort of sound design orchestration. So I have that sort of pulse going on underneath it. Um, I've got a few other bits here. So this beginning, uh, I started to kind of flesh out a little bit in this version. Um, so it's fairly similar to the final, just a bit more details. But you can see here, there's some obvious placeholders. So I knew that was just kind of a gesture and something that I would be filling in later. Um, I think another big obvious one is kind of in this section where I knew, okay, I want it big, um, but, and I'm just going to kind of play this no, just a uh, bit more melodic idea. So that more or less helped me kind of, uh, follow the structure of what I had temped out before. So in the last masterclass, I talked about kind of temping this section where first I wanted this to be kind of the theme, big and happy. And then when we look at the penguin here, we should feel uh, sad and feel sorry for him. So um, I was just going to make, you know, essentially a minor version of uh, the melody. What I ended up with in this, um, is a bit sort of tongue in cheek and it's really, you know, uh, it's very John Williams-esque. Um, and so I wanted it, that sort of the joke that I'm making is that it's very much like Hook. You know, they're flying through the air. And uh, so I pretty much just copied the orchestration from uh, this moment in the Hook score in the flight to Neverland and just filled in my own chords and melody. Uh, so then we get this. Um, so something else just while I'm sort of talking about this middle version here um, is 
I started to use the flute kind of as um, an instrument for the baby penguin. Um, so it comes up quite a lot. And that becomes another part of my uh, narrative vocabulary of how I can sort of um, show the point of view and uh, how the music can sort of tell us what, what we should be feeling at those moments. So um, I'm using it here in the open, the opening. So that's the first place that I kind of establish it. Um, after a lot of this, uh, sort of this pits texture is really more for the caribou. And that comes up again here where the focus is on the caribou again. So uh, we have the pits there. That becomes a placeholder for this section here. But actually in the final, this variation, I turn it into, uh, I have the melody played mostly by the winds, just with uh, essentially pitzing the bass line of it. So there's a lot of details in these gestures that make it a lot more specific uh, kind of to the character. Um, why don't we now jump over to, I'm going to kind of go a little bit through more of the nitty gritty orchestration details um, and kind of looking into this. Because I'd say at this point when I've finished kind of this middle version of the temp track, I'm more or less kind of here in my analogy. There's a rough structure, but some of it's starting to get filled out, but I'm not quite, you know, kind of halfway or two thirds the way through where I really want it to be. And I'd say from this stage, getting it from this middle uh, version to the final is where most of the real work and craft is. Um, so I needed to map this out in order to have it um, very clear where I want all the pieces to fall. And I'm able to not really worry about the arrangement and stuff at this uh, stage because I'm focused on the story. I want to have this all mapped out uh, so I know kind of, you know, what point of view I'm telling the music from, what emotion I want to convey. Then once I have that, I can start to kind of work away from picture quite a lot because then I'm really just making it musical and I'm filling these sections out. Um, so let me jump to the Cubase session. Um, so here is kind of everything in here. And actually, if I just double check which version this is, yeah, we can um, should be able to play through this as well, just to have it synced up. Um, so what I'll do is go through a few of these sections and just show you in the piano roll um, kind of what's there. I won't be able to uh, listen to these individually just because I don't have them all loaded up. Um, that was just for the stability of kind of running it over the stream. But we'll be able to see a kind of a bit more of a breakdown of what the instruments are. Um, so in my template, the way I've got it laid out is that all of the strings are sort of orange brown, winds are uh, this green, then the brass is yellow. And then I've got percussion or a uh, different green, kind of bluish green, um, piano, harp, all that is purple. So let's have a little bit of a look through this opening and you can get a sense of kind of what the orchestration looks like. So I'll sort of uh, look through up to that section so far. Um, so here, 
Oh, sorry about that. Let me, um, thank you for telling me. I'd need to just swap my settings, my output settings. So come through Zoom. Um, for anyone who streams, you'll understand the uh, <laughs> difficulties of routing virtual outputs. Um, anyway, sorry, let's have another qu quick listen through that. So you're not just watching a screen of uh, colored shapes. So I'll go up to that point um, and now starting to address a little bit about the kind of uh, the question about Mickey mousing. So what I did here is I decided what are the most important moments for me to bring out of this. And I think this is something that a lot of people tend to struggle with is kind of what am I hitting? You know, if I'm going to create hit points and then it feels like if you start doing some of them, feels like maybe you need to do all of them, otherwise it stops making sense. Um, but your hit points need to be related to the story. So this is the first one, which is when the first penguin goes through and steals one of these berries. Then the follow-up is here when all of them go through. So that's the kind of first joke and then the second joke. Um, so I'm really just marking it out uh, in those sections. You can see up here, based on my uh, measures, that I have lots of different meter changes and stuff like that to help me hit these. Up here, just to give you a better sort of view of this in the session, um, there's loads. I'm changing meter uh, quite a lot throughout the piece, tempo as well. Um, and this is to make sure that I can kind of hit all of these points specifically. This kind of music is often um, sort of turning on a dime. You know, imagine Tom and Jerry, uh, where they're able to sort of, you know, flip tempo and go up plus or minus 30 BPM or something in an instant, uh, because the picture is providing so much support to do that as well. So let's look back at the piano roll. Oh, sorry, gonna have to. Highlight all these again. So in here, um, this is my first hit. So I've kind of got everything, and this is just a little tag for the QTube at the start. So this is where I'm starting, is the opening of it. So then I've essentially got this section to build up to that first uh, hit. Then I've got my next hit here, two and a half measures later. And then I've got, um, this is sort of my next hit. And this is where I start to change texture. Uh, this is a bit softer of a hit rather than kind of landing directly on it. And then that goes to the end of that section. So this was sort of act one um, as I went over in the last uh, masterclass. So I'm able to then get rid of the picture once I've kind of marked these out and start to just write this out. So this can be a four bar phrase. Then I know that I've just got this two four to make that hit. So it's easy for me to kind of extend this and make it work musically. But structurally, this makes a lot of sense as just a piece of music. So I've got the little intro and then a sort of uh, antecedent phrase. And then as I start the consequent phrase, I'm sort of cutting it off abruptly and that's the joke. So then we get this again. And here I'm not really Mickey mousing anything. I'm just making it again, musical. So 
So I've also got this two four before I land into the next downbeat. So I need to make this feel, I've got essentially a couple of these spaces so that it feels like it's floating in time a little bit. That way, halfway through this bar actually feels like a downbeat. So that then four beats later, this feels like a downbeat. Um, so it's just a little bit of kind of trickery in the meter in order to make that uh, feel steady. And then I'm into uh, the next sort of phrase. So then if we look at this musically, um, this is my next sort of antecedent phrase and then a consequent phrase. And then this chord just to hold it out. Um, so here is a standard four bar phrase. And then I'm just sort of holding the tail. And then this goes to a bar of six, four. Um, but that's how I'm really looking at this to break it down. And the interesting thing about it is when I'm not trying to hit all of these extra spots, I end up hitting some anyway. So in this section in particular, it looks like I'm hitting sort of particular moments like when, uh, or actually it's in this next bit. So this looks like I'm kind of hitting here on the head, uh, but it's actually just part of my phrase. So that's just our brain making that connection anyway. Um, and then, the only thing I'm doing here is changing the texture again from sort of the uh, pitch strings into the winds to kind of highlight the change of focus from the caribou to now the baby penguin that's uh, in frame. Um, so kind of a, quite an extended answer in a way, uh, talking about the um, Mickey mousing, the idea of Mickey mousing these individual hits. I'm really not thinking about it. I'm focused on my story points and letting that lead um, the structure of the music. And then I'm starting to fill it in with the details and the colors to kind of help me shift the focus around. Um, so jumping into the next section, this is my first sort of bit of action. Um, so I've got this essentially a ramp up for this bar just into where we then see the train. So obviously this moves very fast over into this. Um, and then I'm looking at this next section up until he's kind of in the clear. And there's three little uh, sort of subsections to this, including this uh, little ramp up and then into the first bit. So I know I've got sort of three steady bars. Then here, again, we shift the focus and now it's on to the baby penguin. So I change and my arrangement changes too. I make the focus is now on these sort of light winds. I take out uh, the big action strings. I take out the snare drum and I'm having the same uh, rhythm in the snare now just played by hi-hat. So the whole texture becomes a lot lighter. So I'll play through this next section now. So, and then the joke here is obviously that uh, we're cutting into this really light section because uh, the penguin is totally oblivious to the train behind him. Um, so it makes it kind of very light and innocent. Um, and here I, I kind of also get that juxtaposition because I'm starting in on something that's really dramatic here. Um, so we see sort of the sense of urgency, you know, and that um, the caribou starts running for the penguin. So then I'm kind of just cutting between these two. So this is sort of my first half of it, a little cut in into this lighter section, keeping the rhythm going, and then cutting back to the, the big section. Here I'm doing, uh, so this, this first bit, this is pretty just straight 4-4. Uh, four, four. And then I have to lose a beat here in order to make the next hit point back. 
So I'm just trying to create and make this feel like uh, a downbeat again. So I do this just by shifting my rhythm around a little bit. And then that makes essentially by uh, cutting this note out, it makes this set this part feel like a pickup into this bar of four. And it's also with uh, the harmony and kind of what I'm doing here. So just this line, um, I had to work with it a little bit to make sure that this felt like a downbeat so that this felt like a straight bar of four, four into the next section. Um, so that's how I'm sort of getting around these meter changes and things like that. Um, I have another one here at the end of it. So then this is just building up. Uh, I only have three. This is kind of easy to do at the end just because I can essentially uh, use this just as a straight kind of intense buildup uh, into more of kind of a dissonant um, texture. And I could do that for three beats. I could do it for five beats. As soon as I cut off, it's going to work uh, with the hit point there. So just play through that section one more time. Sorry, just cut a little bit. So, and then these little bits here. Um, so we're moving into this next uh, section here. There's a, it's a lot more sort of broken up. Um, so we're gonna see a few more different bits and pieces that um, I've, uh, this, is, this takes a little bit more kind of choreography uh, to get all of this to sort of work together. Um, it's a lot more gestures. So I'm just sort of, you know, hitting this triangle hit. You can see also that this isn't really on the grid, this triangle hit, or it's kind of in the middle of a beat. Um, that's okay because these uh, strings are sort of holding the space. So this is a good time for me to make meter changes as well uh, because it's easy for the musicians to just sustain on a single note and then you can change tempo under them. You can change the meter under them because they're just going to be playing uh, the same note anyway. So that's a good time for me to sort of hide these meter changes in. It also helps me just establish what's on the grid. Um, there's a bit here. It came on beat two. I don't, I'm not super concerned with that as long as it falls on sort of strong beats. So we'll look at that next action bit in a moment. Um, so just looking through this little bit, um, there's not so much to say here. Um, obviously, this was just a single a held bass clarinet note in the sort of temp version. So I just filled this out a little bit more with the strings, with some lower winds, uh, but it's still a single note. Um, just coming up to this joke here, and then I added... Uh, I think it was a, um, maybe a clave or something here, just on that kind of hit. Um, this is also another point I meant to make earlier is that I'm really, I, when I'm scoring this, I'm doing this without the sound effects. Because if I can make all of this work without the little bits of sound effects and dialogue and stuff like that, uh, then as soon as I add them, it usually all fits into place. It's kind of like I've done my job to do a lot of heavy lifting and make sure that it's supporting the picture on its own. And then I can check in to make sure that I'm just not, you know, stepping on any toes or getting in the way of something else that's uh, already being done. So then here, I'm just bringing back that same pitch theme again. Um, and then here I do kind of the positive one. And then this is a little bit more sinister uh, as he comes and steals the berry. Um, sorry, Cubase just got confused of where the marker was. Uh, 
And then this little magical moment, there's a bit of uh, the strings. There's a little bit of kind of uh, tremolo and uh, Celeste doubling the chords and then a mark tree just to kind of help fill all of this out. Again, just making this musical. So I've got my bars of four and then just an extra couple beats in a bar of two, four before this drops. Then this is my next sort of hit point um, into this shift. And then I've got this ramp up until the hit. So this becomes then my next bigger bit of action. Um, so why don't we play through this whole section, uh, which really comes up into the sort of flying theme. Uh, so I'll play that section. We'll look at this section in a moment. Um, so here we go. Um, I'm just ripping off Tchaikovsky. Uh, one of my favorite things to do. I recommend all of you rip off Tchaikovsky as much as you can. Um, just a simple ramp up, pretty much throwing it on everyone. And then I've got uh, one thing here is I really needed to kind of establish uh, what the rhythms are. So I think that's really clear whenever you're doing, uh, or it's really necessary whenever you're doing something like this, that's very uh, kind of rhythmic action stuff. You need to understand you might have different rhythmic ideas happening, but they have to kind of align. It has to be really clear. Otherwise, it'll just sound like a texture. Um, so I've got that main initial idea. So that's where you can see sort of the darker strings here. Let me also get rid of there's some muted uh, regions here that are kind of getting in the way of us seeing what's going on. Um, there we are. So this should be a little bit cleaner uh, to see. Let's figure out where I am in the timeline. Um, so I've got that initial rhythmic idea here. Um, and this pretty much is what I wrote. These first four bars are that first idea. So I have this going on as a texture in the strings, in kind of the upper strings. Then I've got the horns pulsing this rhythm, uh, which is this uh, sort of, uh, I'm, I'm accenting every uh, fourth note here, or sorry, every third note, um, and kind of getting this to fit into uh, bar four. Then I've got my third kind of rhythmic idea here, which is really the, the melodic idea that builds up through this. Um, and that's happening down in the bass. And then another, uh, this is called the rush, when you have essentially you throw uh, all of, you know, kind of a, a huge scale leading up into the next uh, note. Um, or so I've got kind of a harp gliss going here. This is a sort of rush in the strings and the winds coming up. Um, and then I'm letting this more or less play. So I'm not trying to hit too many sections of this. I'm letting it play under all of this. Also, there's a lot of little going back and forth, this tug of war. There's so many things that are happening in the picture. So I don't want to, you know, kind of Mickey Mouse as much in this section. The only section that I'm sort of uh, hitting or the joke that I'm catching is that by uh, luck, really, it sort of happened that these hits sort of fell in time with where my melody was. So I just highlighted them a little bit with the percussion. So I've got some uh, xylophone, 16th notes on those, doubled with marimba as well, and then some tubular bells uh, hitting it too. So it just helps to kind of highlight that, you know, that there is a joke there uh, with the caribou hitting his head over and over again. And then I let that play through, just building an intensity all the way up until we get to the flying section. So just one more time in this action bit.
Sure. Brian was just telling me too, people are asking a little about, about the libraries. Um, in this, really, I'm using three libraries. Um, I'm using for my strings and percussion is pretty much all Abbey Road 1 uh, from Spitfire. Um, I think it's a great all-around library. Um, I'm also using some Spitfire chamber strings uh, for sections and things like that, just to fill out um, a bit more and, and have a bit more control over the sound, especially the more melodic phrases. I think it's better to use something like chamber strings or at least where you have individual sections. Um, so I'll show you kind of just in the demo here, I've got uh, like particularly the, the end here, um, this melody I have, I'm using in uh, chamber strings and then uh, I have more control over the individual lines. A lot of this though, especially in the winds and brass, I'm really orchestrating it um, how it would be for orchestra and I have it laid out as such. So I'm really thinking about, is this flute one that would actually play this line? Am I doubling it with flute two? Is there a time when I'm using one flute versus two or three flutes uh, and using the piccolo? So really I'm, I'm orchestrating it uh, in the DAW as much as I can. Uh, for winds and brass, I'm using all Aaron Ventures libraries. Um, I'm a huge fan of these. I've talked about them in other places. Uh, I'm not endorsed by Aaron. I just really like his products. Uh, so it's infinite winds and infinite brass uh, from him. Go buy them, uh, especially if you're a student, you can get a discount on them. Um, he does an academic discount. I just think Aaron makes really great products um, and I'm happy to, to push and support him. Uh, what I really like about him is he makes the, the instruments sound like uh, how they would in a concert hall. Um, so it's very realistic feedback when you're writing for the, uh, with these, um, I think, especially winds and brass, it's something that when you really get into the details of orchestration, uh, you need to have control over the individual timbres of instruments and to understand how you're combining a couple of them together, um, where you just won't be able to have that when you've got, um, you know, like an ensemble brass patch or something like that. Uh, or an ensemble winds. An ensemble winds patch makes no sense to me. Uh, winds have very different colors. So I don't know why you would just have like generic high winds. Anyway, I won't get into that. Uh, but I've also got a little bit of this is Cinebrass, the monster low brass short. Uh, this is helpful just for a couple bits and pieces here where it's, you know, just sort of doubling up on some of this low end and making it a bit beefier. Um, so I have that here in this section that um, I said is very, uh, very much hook. Let's get rid of that muted region. Um, so it's doing exactly what is in John Williams orchestration uh, for that section. Let me just, let's look at the piano roll again. So um, what I've got here is it's a rush in the strings up to the melody, playing the melody in octaves, uh, first and second violins. It's deceptively simple, uh, this orchestration. Then I've got the violas doing the chord progression, and it's just Alberti bass. Uh, so sort of left-hand piano, and then it's just double time. Then I've got the brass uh, just pulsing the um, harmony. So that's filling out. I've also got the oboes doubling the horns doing that. And then the flutes are doing, flutes and clarinets are doing some of these runs. Um, so this is just kind of all these little flourishes. Um, and I'm also being careful about even down to where these are, this is sort of overkill for something like this, because you wouldn't notice it in the demo, um, but even just making sure I know where each of them are breathing. So like this is my clarinet three, and it is breathing on this note, and this is my flute two, and it's breathing on this note. Um, it's just good habits to get into. The more you can think about this, even at this stage, uh, when you're really drawing it out, uh, the more it will translate. Um, there's also this really lovely texture I love that John Williams does is uh, in the piano, he's just playing this uh, 
sort of mid range um, where it's just doubling the harmony a little bit. And this is all pedaled uh, by chord. So it just creates this really nice sort of magical effect uh, over the top of it. And then I've got my melody playing and where the melody is holding, um, the, what makes this feel like it's flying and why I'm kind of, uh, it's a bit tongue in cheek to hook is because you get all of these big textures up here and you just cut out the bass. So when you cut out the bottom, uh, it makes it feel very light. And if you listen to any of John Williams flying themes, if you listen to uh, Hook, if you listen to E.T., um, it will, I think he does the same thing in some of the um, Harry Potter, like in the Quidditch cues, um, just cuts out the bass and it feels like they're flying. Uh, and so then he's just got this as essentially a sort of counter line that's happening uh, at the end of the phrase. So let's listen through that section again. Uh, and then as I shift to this next one, I pair the orchestration down quite a bit so that we can focus more on this flute line, um, flutes and clarinets uh, here when we see the penguin. And then just coming down and you'll see again here, I uh, kind of trick the ear. I've got a bar of five, four. And so I'm just kind of using these um, polyrhythms. So I've got, this is just in straight four. And then I'm using these triplet figures to come down until I get into a more steady rhythm. And that also helps me to kind of decrease the energy as we come out of this uh, from the air. So before we jump to the sort of end section, um, just a quick note on this as well. We've got, uh, as I was saying before, kind of in the final version, I've just essentially just taken that same string idea and I've put it on the winds because now it's a focus on the penguin. Um, so it's sort of showing that the penguin is very carefree, just going back to his family, you know, sort of unaware of all the danger and everything that's just happened. Uh, so we get that. And then you can see this, uh, the cursor slow down um, as it changed tap tempo pretty rapidly there. Again, I'm changing tempo on a held note. It's easy for the players to, I'm thinking about if I was recording this live um, in the studio, it'd be really easy for the players to make this change. Uh, so typically tempo changes can be uh, difficult if you don't plan for them. Uh, same with meter changes, but this is the correct way to kind of account for that. So I have this falling on a downbeat. It's really easy to, far, to follow three bars of 4-4, four, four, and then the tempo change on the sustained note, and that will help us lead into the next section. And it gives them a couple bars to adjust to the new tempo. So now at the end, this last section um, is pretty easy to lay out. Um, 
And again, I've got, here's my sort of first uh, shift. And then at this tempo, you know, I'm adjusting the tempo so that I know I'm going between that and here is four even bars. Uh, that lets me play this very musically. And then from here, this is the shift where it all changes. And I have that going to the uh, end. And then I'm just hitting this little tag for the Q-tube. Um, so I've got essentially my eight bar phrase and I've had to just cut it down to fit into seven bars. So if you remember my original melody had this sort of B section of it, this melody came down, went back up, came down again and a little resolution. So essentially I'm just drawing out this um, uh, descending scale uh, that's harmonized and just bringing it down and I'm slowly pulling instruments off of it to kind of get down to where we pretty much just have the lower strings by the end of that. And then everybody's out for the piano. Um, what I'm doing here, so this is my theme. I also change it slightly. So I've, I've got it um, is sort of all major here. Um, this was E minor in the original. So I'm making it uh, G major. And then I'm, I'm reharmonizing this opening uh, section to that. So I've got these sort of descending chords, um, but I'm just making this a little more sad to reflect this moment. So this is the more melancholic bit, and then it gets into the happy section. So just watch the end of that one more time. Um, and then I think we'll open it up for uh, some more questions. So before we open up, I just want to reiterate a couple of things about this. So um, once again, I'm kind of, this is the uh, essentially a very cliff notes version of my whole method. Um, so now, you know, I hope that you'll have been able to see a bit more clearly kind of what the scoring process is for me from start to finish. Um, so I start with that initial idea that I sketched out on the piano, and then I come up with some very rough variations and ideas, and then I can put those into place, temp it out, and then I can uh, start to flesh out the details a lot more. Um, so just to kind of give a shameless plug, this is kind of what I cover in my course, um, much more in depth, obviously. Um, and just to also reiterate kind of what we've got for um, members, viewers of the QTube is uh, there's a sort of perpetual 40% discount uh, that we're doing. So you can use a link that uh, Brian's providing for this month. 10% of it is also going to support uh, score relief. Um, and also in case anyone is sort of concerned or on the fence, um, if you, because I have it as a prize for score relief as well, if you bought it in January and you end up winning it, I'll happily just give you a refund. Uh, so, you know, don't worry too much. Um, if you're interested in it, go for it. Um, also part of the course, I stream twice a month. Um, and I do these, uh, feedback sessions with my students. So I've got another one coming up, uh, on Saturday in a couple days. And those I do on my, um, it's essentially a zoom call where we, I look through my students work, uh, and then I stream that to my Twitch simultaneously. So even if you're not a member, you can just watch that for free and you can get some tips and some advice and feedback. Uh, so you can kind of see a bit more about that process too. Um, cool. So I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, this whole uh, little short was a lot of fun to do. Uh, it was a lot of work for sure. 
Um, but that's also the fun of it is doing all these little details. Um, it takes a lot of time to really go bit by bit, focus on each of these sections, but that's the difference of what makes something really effective. Uh, you know, so it's, it's worth putting in and, you know, I'm, I'll tell you everywhere I ripped off somebody's orchestration. I, I encourage you to go do the same. Uh, you know, this is the best way to learn is, is to go and study. Uh, cool. All right. That's enough for me for a little bit. Uh, so Brian, maybe you can, uh, rustle up some questions. Yeah, sure. There's quite a few, uh, coming in. I hope that I've managed to actually switch my microphone on successfully. Uh, let me just check that. Yeah, it looks like you should be hearing me. Okay. Uh, it doesn't matter. Actually, it's important that Mike can hear me because I'm going to be giving Mike the questions. Um, so yeah, I'm just, I'm just grabbing some new ones that are coming in. They're coming in thick and fast, but first of all, of course, I and, uh, and many of the people in the chat, uh, want to thank you, Mike, for that. Uh, there was a lot of love. There was a lot of enjoyment of that. A lot of positive uh, stuff and uh, some tips there. Little little gems that you unleashed uh, were really appreciated about, for example, the flying uh, sequence, the little tip there about cutting cutting some of the low end out and stuff. So yeah, little little gems there that people really enjoyed amongst the, the thing as a whole. So yeah, before we get into the questions, I just wanna express that to you. Yeah, well, thank you. I, you know, I'm grateful for the opportunity to do it and i'm really grateful that you guys care uh to to come on and watch uh so i'm i'm glad you enjoyed it well yes indeed i mean let us thank you the watchers for watching and liking and and questioning and chatting to each other in a friendly and grown-up manner <laughs> um okay so we have some questions here uh let's go through them so some of them might have been addressed and if they have mike just say yeah, we addressed that earlier on um, because some people might have come in late, you know, and missed some of it. So uh, Super Blonde, who is one of our regular viewers, I think. Uh, my question right now is deciding time signatures for regions of a queue. So this comes up a hell of a lot, yeah, this type of thing. Example, choosing between three bars of 5-4 or four bars of 7-4 or three bars of 6-8, etc., considering difference in musical feel. Is there anything more you want to say on that that you feel you haven't? Uh... Uh, it is a great question. I sort of glossed over it. So I think it, it's great to bring it up and, and sort of discuss that a little bit uh, more. Also, Super Bond, thank you for your question. You're also an active member in the uh, Discord. Uh, so great to have you here as well. Um, just another quick little plug. If you, uh, I have a Discord, you can find it on my website. Um, it's fun. There's a lot of people kind of we're chatting. I share some things in there. I shared this uh, a day early yesterday uh, just to show people that. Um, but it's also great. It's sort of easy access to me. Um, I'm, I'm on there. You can sort of reach out. It's almost like texting me. Um, so feel free to join the Discord. Um, so talking about time signatures. Um, yes. So really, it's, uh, I'm always after the most musical solution. That's what I'm trying to think of. Um, so if I jump back to the, I'll use the example of, um, from the first bit of kind of action music. I'm gonna share my screen back so we can look at that again. So in this section, uh, I have to change meter um, in a couple places here. I'm looking for the most musical section here. So the first question is, you know, do I need a bar of uh, seven four? Well, is your is your theme in seven? You know, is it uh, or is it in four? And you need an extra, uh, you know, three beats, or you have two bars you're trying to cut a beat out of. Then it would really be a bar of four and a bar of three. Um, so write it in a more musical way because if the musician C seven four. First of all, always write your music as if it's going to be played live. Uh, I think that's just a good habit. It makes you write better music. Uh, the more you can do it, the better understanding you're going to have of how it all comes together. Why is John Williams' music so good and so enjoyable? And I've played a lot of it in orchestras myself. Uh, it's so idiomatic. It is orchestral music. It makes sense on the page. 
uh, you know, for everybody playing it. So these details are important to think about um, to understand why why you would use one meter versus another. Um, so I'm mostly my my theme is really in four four, and most of what I'm writing here is in four four. So the only time I'm using a bar of two, three, five, six is because it makes sense for me to kind of fit that into the cut. So here, if I look at this rhythmic idea, this is three bars of four. So that's what's driving this section. So that is a very clean and clear uh, three bars of four. That's where my changes are happening. Then here I have a bar of three into a bar of four. So again, I'm thinking more about, I need to end at the end of it. Um, one way I, I sort of say this sometimes, you need to start at the start and end at the end. So you make your change midway through whatever your phrase is. Um, so here, I think I talked about this sort of at the very end of the last masterclass uh, as well. Uh, talked about that kind of idea a little bit. But um, here, I want this to feel like a bar of four, four. And so how do I do that kind of coming out of three? I need to create an, a, a strong upbeat in order to make this feel like a downbeat. So a lot of this just comes down to making it feel relative uh, to one another. So if I play through this section. So this is the upbeat that makes this feel like bum, 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 bum. It's also the shape of that phrase is the same as here as it's coming up. So this is familiar now. So that feels like a strong bar of four. So that helps me kind of cut that together. And then the reason for using a bar of three here, instead of using a bar of three in the middle, uh, and then using like, this could be three, four, and then four, four could start here, but it wouldn't make sense rhythmi rhythmically with what I have going on. This is the strong pulse that's pushing forward, which is the same coming off the back of this. And then it essentially gets cut off at the end of that. So I'll play through that. So if I had the space, I could have easily gone for another note. I could have easily built this up uh, and sort of copy paste this over, cut, could have gone higher. That would have also made sense um, musically. But then because I get the cut of the film and this cutoff and I sort of make a big uh, bold cutoff, it works as a bar three and we don't notice it. We just notice that it gets cut. Um, so I hope that kind of helps answer that question a bit um, of sort of why we choose certain meters. It really has to do with musicality. So you could think about what is the structure of your theme or your rhythmic idea and let that be um, kind of driving the decision on what meter you use. Hope that helps answer that. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, good, good, good. I'm juggling, juggling here, still, still keeping my head above water. Uh, Mike <clears throat> Bridegam Music says, question for Mike, does he find, oh, we, we've discussed this a little bit, but I'll, I'll, I'll just mention it because he was uh, good enough to type it into the chat. Uh, does he find the idea of Mickey Mousing a less used style in modern animation? I guess we've kind of covered that really. Well, I think it just depends on kind of what you consider Mickey Mousing. So, um, it's really, uh, I mean, you know, I would say go watch Ice Age, you know, or Kung Fu Panda or How to Train Your Dragon. You know, you're going to find all of these same tropes as you would have, you know, in Bambi. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really just what's the function of it. You know, uh, I think in Bambi, it might have been a little bit more to do with kind of sound design. So it's sort of using, you know, pizzicato strings when a deer opens their eyes or something like that. Now it's really about what function does it serve? Um, you know, does it serve a narrative function to it? So here where I'm, um, I'll share my screen back again. Um, in the opening, I'm sort of Mickey mousing this section, but I'm leaving it sort of floating a bit free. 
And so I'm just by giving space and making it uh, essentially lose track of kind of where the beat is for a moment, it helps give it this sense of it being sort of suspended. And that makes sense with what the caribou is doing because he's looking around and is confused. So while he's sort of looking around, I'm not necessarily thinking, I, I did this, I wrote these bars away from picture. I'm thinking musically, but then where it hits makes us think like, oh, that look, look the other way, look back, feels like a hit point. Um, but there's some of them that like, I'm not hitting this one. And so it doesn't feel as important. And then it makes this one feel more important. Um, but we're, our brain is kind of making that connection. Uh, so really it's about the narrative function here more so than uh, trying to kind of uh, imitate each gesture uh, in a sort of sound design way. I hope that kind of helps answer that question a bit more. Yes, I hope so too. Um, am I here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, good. Um, right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there was a lot of discussion about Mickey Mousing, really. I think that's something that people are really interested in. I suppose generally it's that principle of how much music. That's the basic question, isn't it? How much music? And, uh, you know, people struggle, I think, with that. I, uh, I, is... I think really just ask yourself why. Why would you do it? Mm -hmm. You know, what's the, what's the purpose of, of what you're trying to achieve with it? And because uh, sometimes I think people feel like, oh, well, it's animation. So, you know, woodwinds, I should have woodwind flourishes. But what's the purpose? You know, what if there needs to be a purpose behind each gesture and each detail that you're doing. Um, so because sometimes I think we could see it sort of from the outside, like, oh, I see this in animation all the time mm -hmm. without understanding the individual function for each project. Um, so I think that's, you know, maybe a sort of guiding principle is, Try to figure out why you're what you're trying to accomplish with it, um, and then that can tell you if it's necessary or not. Uh huh. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, all right, Ma Matteo Pirovano. Uh, question for Mike. I often find oh, Mickey Mousing again. Um, <laughs> okay, we've we've covered that. But thank you, Matteo, for your question. I hope that you agree that we've covered it. Um, ah, Salat Production. Uh, now, Ruskam, Napisal. <laughs> but I think we've already discussed it as well. He um, was asking about the libraries, and I think people were very interested and very impressed by the way with the um, library uh, that you mentioned, the name of which escapes me, but I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Um, people, yeah, people... Aaron Ventures stuff. Yes, um, yes. Yeah, I mean, I think I'll also just say on libraries because, you know, I'm, I'm kind of very much about this of uh, just finding tools that work. I'm, I'm not a gearhead, you know, I'm not mm. someone who yeah. has a thousand sample libraries or is combining this sound with that sound. I want something that just simply works. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, this again, is, it's about serving a purpose again, I suppose, right? I mean, yeah, and, it, and in its function. So just yeah. to give you a quick example, you can see what's highlighted green. This is just my flute one line. This is how I look through kind of each of my libraries. If I've got my velocity, I've got my modulation, expression, and MIDI volume. Uh, this is covered in the course. This is in unit two. I talk about kind of how you approach programming. Mm -hmm. um, really, this is it. I'm doing this on every single region, every line. I'm carefully crafting the performance of all of these using modulation, expression, and MIDI volume I use as a kind of uh, my first mixing fader. Uh, so this helps me control the balance of the instruments against one another. Uh, really, it's just mastering these principles um, or understanding them rather than mastering. It's pretty simple. You can make amazing stuff with it. Um, and in my course, I use as an example, I use just the BBC Symphony Orchestra Discover samples and do a, a mock-up of a Mozart piece. Um, just to kind of prove that you can make a really good sound and convincing mock-up with free samples. Yeah. Uh, so they're free if you're a student and I think 50 quid if you're not, mm -hmm. um, you know, so really it's about craft, um, more than, you know, which product you buy, mm -hmm. um, understanding these principles well, will let you, you know, uh, be good at programming. 
Um, so I, I just kind of harp on that point a little bit because, um, it's not just in these things or my students, you know, you see it on forums and Facebook groups all the time. Everybody's interested in kind of getting the tools, but the tools don't make the composer. The craft does. Yeah. Um, so really understanding the fundamentals of good programming. Uh, that's when my mixes started to sound good is when I really kind of understood what I was trying to do with it uh, and the signal flow, how all of that went through. Mm -hmm. so I hope that is helpful. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. I think I might sign up for the course. Uh, sounds awesome. Um, how are you doing for time, Mike? By the way, because I mean, I'm aware that you've generously given an hour and a half already. How are you? Well, two hours, including the time that we spoke before we went live. I'm, I'm happy to keep going. I because the last time we just kept going, I, I sort of cleared the evening, so we can you, we can go for a while. I'll just let you know when I'm burnt out. You're how a about machine. That? You're a machine. Okay, uh, it must be the jujitsu. Um, all right, where are we at? Uh, Mike, do you, this is from Alchemical Sound Design, Nathan Quaid. Mike, do you start with a standard track template or is it specific to each score? Yes, I have a big template. Um, that This helps me with um, consistency, I think, more than anything. So I have in my template is essentially big groups. Um, I'll share again just to sh sort of show you what's in there. Mm -hmm. um, so this is my template. I've got my strings. I've got my ensemble patches, short and long, my sections, uh, short and long solos. Then I've got a couple different brass libraries. It's mostly the air and venture stuff is really all I'm kind of using these days. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit of some cine brass and stuff. Uh, same with the winds, um, especially winds. Aaron stuff is really kind of all I'm using. Uh, Cinewinds for a couple like ethnic instruments. Uh, there's this tiny little detail that uh, is sort of buried in the mix, more like an Easter egg, but I've got this penny whistle that is sort of on the uh, whistle of the train. Um, so just little things like that uh, I'll use. And then um, just some basic choir stuff. My sort of keyboard instruments, organ, pianos, harp, um, that kind of stuff. Then percussion, pitched and unpitched. That's kind of my main stuff. Then I've got more sound design percussion. So in this, all I'm using is just like a hi hat from a drum kit, um, and I have some bigger, you know, um, kind of the the big boomy percussion stuff. Uh, guitars, some uh, acoustic, electric, bass, and then just a smattering of synths. And then this is sort of impacts and risers. Uh, so these are things like just uh, gravity, you know, sub hits, that kind of stuff. Um, and then just some little uh, risers. This is mostly a library called Rise and Hit. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, so that's pretty much all that's in here. I'm probably going to make a new template uh, soonish um, that's even less than this um, because there's a lot that I'm just not really even using. Um, I could take out half the brass and wind libraries. Um, I could take out a lot of the synths. I built this into here, but then after you sort of use them all on a few projects, you kind of need different sounds anyway. Um, so I probably won't even include synths in my next template update. Um, but I like to just have essentially an orchestral layout. Um, and this, again, helps with consistency because I can do all my routing through reverbs and whatever. Um, so it's pretty much pre-mixed. So now when I'm programming this in, um, it already sounds good. You know, everything is panned. I've got the reverb set. Um, and it also helps with printing stems. Um, so when I've written the piece, then I can just export all the stems very easily. Uh, and then I can deliver to a music editor or for a mixing engineer, uh, kind of whatever I need. I can do all that at once. Um, and not to be, you know, too uh, shameless about it, but there is a video where I, in the course where I sort of talk about printing stems and go through the template a little bit. Uh, my template as a breakdown exists uh, somewhere on the internet. Uh, I know I've done it kind of in uh, some, some place. I've sort of talked through these things a little bit. Um, so you could probably find that, but I hope that uh, helps answer sort of the, the how and why a little bit. I think above and beyond the question. Thank you. Uh, tremendous value for money here. Um, 
And of course, in terms of libraries, we have some fantastic prizes in Score Relief as well for people who are looking to expand or perhaps just up the quality of the libraries that they, they have within their templates. Um, all right, Mike Bridegam again. Um, question for Mike, do you compose your thematic material with specific instruments in mind? If not, do you choose the melodic instrument slash instruments that best work with the key? Or do you change the key? Um, so uh, mostly, I usually just start sketching from piano. Um, and, you know, I like to have, uh, I, I think of piano because I'm not a pianist. Piano is a very just neutral sound to me. Um, so it doesn't kind of give me any specific idea about instrumentation. I like to do that at least to the point that I can really clarify that lead sheet version of what my theme is. Um, so what I showed you, the initial um, sort of audio track of just the piano as a theme, that's what I like to kind of clarify first before I start thinking about other instruments. As I start temping it out, then, you know, I might start imagining, okay, this is, you know, I know I'm going to do sort of piano and strings here, or I'll probably do this on pizzicato strings. Um, and all of that I find helpful, but I try not to get bogged down in the details. Something that I notice with uh, a lot of my students sometimes is they'll tell me, okay, I've got this idea, you know, for a cue. So, so ready, it's going to be string harmonics here. And then I might do something like, you know, maybe some brass and I'm kind of like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, you're, you're kind of painting without the lines, you know, you, uh, so if you, I try to kind of at least clarify what my structure is of the, the actual thematic material before I think about arrangement. And that helps me separate it a bit where you can arrange happy birthday in a million ways. Um, but understanding kind of the, the style and what you want to achieve with it, you need to know that first before thinking, you know, uh, what about uh, glockenspiel, you know, or something like that. Um, and the second part of that question was about kind of specific keys for instruments and that sort of stuff. Um, I mean, definitely at in when you're in the detail stage, uh, it's really important to think about this. I think of it more, um, I mean, sort of keys, but range. Uh, so if you know, yeah, I want, you know, the flute to be playing this melody here and kind of where you have it sitting isn't really in the sweet spot of where that could be, then, you know, that's where you might kind of adjust the key. But would I go way out of the way to adjust the key just for that? Um, it's a balance, you know, so it's kind of asking what's more important to this again, you know, John Williams is obviously the, you know, the master we all look up to and you'll find this, that, you know, his, this is the mark of a, of a real, you know, orchestral composer and somebody of his level of craft is that he's writing with all of that in mind, you know? So if you listen to Jurassic park versus Jurassic world, the original Jurassic park, all of those uh, cues are in, you know, those keys for a reason. And then Jurassic World got kind of music edited, a lot of that music, and it's in different keys. And so all of a sudden you're putting the clarinet in the wrong range, you know, or something, and uh, it completely messes up the system. So, but that's a very kind of high level thinking uh, in terms of orchestration. That's, that's very detail oriented. Um, so definitely worth considering, but that happens, I, I think, when you're thinking about those details. All right, great. Brilliant. Thank you. I, wonder, I wish I had $10 for every time someone mentions John Williams. Goodness me. <laughs> um, and I love your use of quid, Mike. You know, the colloquial. I love it. I really I, I've been here long enough. There's nothing better than hearing quid in an American accent. I love that. Um, <laughs> I guess it's like me saying 10 bucks. Probably sounds strange, huh? It just um, makes you sound American. 10 bucks. Okay. Um, all righty. Oh, yeah, this is an interesting one about the real world. Um, Andy WL. If I use a lot of time changing or changes, I suppose, is it... Is it playable by an orchestra or does the director go mad? Um, so, well, one, the director probably doesn't uh, know anything about time signature changes. Um, it's, 
really more, you know, is it working? So some people, you know, ask me like, if, if I change tempo too drastically or they're afraid to change too much. Um, but again, if you look at Tom and Jerry, I think that's kind of the best example of that working very effectively is it'll switch between moods very quickly, you know, and it, it will just go. So it'll be super fast action, you know, for one second, and then it goes into something very light and slow and calm, and then it'll ramp right back up. It can turn on a dime. Um, so where it comes to kind of the real world, I think maybe if you're talking about in a recording scenario, uh, it's just being intelligent about that. So these things can be accomplished. And I, I talked a little bit about kind of where I would put a tempo change or a meter change so that it's more uh, playable by the musicians. And that just has to do with understanding uh, the mechanics of recording. You know, if I put these things during sustained sections, it's really easy. I mean, imagine being the player. Uh, and when I was in college, I played double bass in a bunch of recording sessions. And so I got to understand kind of all sides of it as well. And if you've got a big section and then all of a sudden tempo change and you're just holding a note, it's really easy for you. You're sitting there and all of a sudden you hear the click change, you know, and you're like, okay, now I get it. And now you're ready to move into the next one. Um, so, uh, I don't know if this really answers what you're asking, but, uh, it just has to work. It has to make sense with the story and it has to make sense with what's going on in the picture. Um, you know, so I, I wouldn't say like, yes or no, use lots of tempo changes or don't. Um, it depends on what you need. I guess he's just concerned that he might create something in the mock-up that actually is kind of a nightmare to play, but, uh. I mean, another thing is, uh, you know, if like with rough tempo changes or meter changes or something like that, we just drop into it in the recording, you know, so you'll play the section up to that point. And then usually, so say we go from, you know, six, eight and uh, 70 BPM. And then all of a sudden we drop into four, four and it's 132. Then what we would do in the recording session is we'd say, okay, we're going to drop into the bar at the 4-4 and we're going to give you eight clicks in the new tempo uh, into it. So then they would just create a click track at 132 for eight clicks, and then that will play before they drop in. Um, so then the musicians and the conductor can just hear two bars into the uh, tempo change. Uh -huh. By the way, your revelation that you played double bass has attracted the comment I knew Mike was a well, an intelligent, well-rounded individual. There you go. A fellow bass, double bass player, I suppose. There we go. Um, yeah, I mean, I remember for what it's worth, I mean, I, you know, what do I know? But um, I remember that during the score relief recording, you know, of the winning score last year that it was done, it was actually done in sections, you know, probably in exactly the way that you've just described. And it was interesting to see how they broke it down into those sections, so, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm you know, always happy to chat about recording uh, stuff as well. It's something I've been fortunate to have, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of hours in studios, uh, recording orchestras. And, uh, you know, it's a skill that I can only recommend, try to do it as much as you can, uh, you know, whether it's small or big scale. Um, you will learn so much more in a three hour recording session than you will from, uh, you know, studying a book for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. How are you doing, Mike? Are you still with us? Are you still full of energy? Doing good. All right. Um, <clears throat> another one from Mike Breidegam. Um, and he does apologize that he keeps asking so many questions. No problem, Mike. Um, all righty. Yeah, this is a good one. This is a meaty one. Uh, it seems like for the more action sequences, you have closer orchestration as opposed to more open orchestration for the dramatic and lighter spots. Is that a common technique? Um, if we're talking about, uh, I guess, just to define what you mean by close, closer orchestration, are you talking about kind of having, like, as far as the range of frequencies covered? Um, Ver, I don't you know. know. I mean, I can only read what he's written. I mean, I, yes, I don't really know anything more than you from that. Perhaps he's still with us and he might clarify the question. Um, oh. I'll just 
kind of pull this up as an example, uh, looking through one of those uh, action sequences. Um, Perhaps just a general observation about how you would differ approaching the orchestration for the action as opposed to the lighter. I don't know. So looking at this section um, here, this is the first bit with the train. So this is the first kind of action sequence. Um, um, so I guess just to clarify, like, do you mean sort of closed voicing versus open voicing? I think that is maybe sort of what we're getting into here. Um, so kind of with that in mind, um, what, I'm, what I'm talking about with closed voicing is like, if we're talking about having a lot of these chords kind of close together, like having a lot of stuff that's happening together versus this is a bit more sparse and sort of spread out across the range. Um, I think it has to do more with sort of thick versus thin. Um, because for here, this is specifically, I'm using flutes and pits uh, and spreading that range because it keeps it kind of light. Um, and so I'm just sort of ticking along with the rhythm in the background. Um, but here, I've mostly just got it spread in octaves. So this is pretty spread out, but it's a much thicker texture. There's a lot more doublings going on. There's a lot more things happening. And then here is even more so where I've got kind of a combination of that. Um, so it's definitely sort of small energy here versus big energy here in the next section, especially in that ramp up at the very end of that, doubling all the brass and this sort of build up. Um, if I jump ahead to this section, uh, let me just get rid of these that are doubled. Probably delete them, but sometimes I... Cool. So yeah, looking at kind of this section here, this becomes much more... Uh, kind of active, and it is intentionally very sort of uh, closed, you know, in this texture. That was sort of the design of it initially. Um, once I have that, and I have this sort of thick texture, I can start sort of tacking things on and around it. Um, it's, I think it's easier to write big, full music um, and kind of have the whole orchestra going in this kind of style of music um, versus you know, dealing with something like really particular chamber forces. Um, here with this flying section is also sort of quite closed and everything is sort of doubled in and around itself. Um, and so it's very particular in what instruments are coming out on top. Um, and this has to do more specifically with sort of where it sits in each of their ranges. Um, so um yeah you will find that a bit and then when we get to the more like intimate sections they're a bit more sparse same here this is very sparse intentionally it's probably the most sparse section of the whole uh queue and it's intentionally at the point where the caribou feels very alone um and then uh it gets much more kind of big and grand and covers a, a wider frequency range so I, i'm sort of accessing more forces there um so yeah i think sometimes you can think of it in those ways of like sort of close close up can be small small can be can feel sort of more intimate whereas big sort of puts you more at a distance you know if you think about it like one person talking to you uh next to you is a one-to-one -one conversation Whereas like seeing a crowd at a stadium is, uh, you know, everybody is um, part of one big mass rather than individuals. Um, so when we come down to kind of a single instrument, it makes us focus on that very particularly and could be used in a much more kind of intimate way. Awesome, awesome, awesome. They're flying in. Um, okay, this will probably be a quick one. And I think we might have addressed it last time. Uh, George Gagnidze, uh, did you write the music in a notation software and import the MIDI into Cubase? No, um, but uh, it's a good question because, so I did everything in the DAW. Every, the, the project only exists in Cubase. There were sections of this where I thought, actually it might be easier if I did kind of notate this out um, but I'm kind of at a point I'm used to working in the DAW so much that I'm, I sort of see notation and MIDI roll almost the same. Uh, kind of when I look at the piano roll, it's, is sort of the same as me looking at a score. 
Mm-hmm. Um, one reason I'm I'm kind of particular about keeping in the DAW is kind of just um, segregating responsibilities. You know, the composer's job is getting the music approved. So uh, you're only responsible as the composer for creating the demo and getting that across the line. Beyond that, you're supervising the rest of the music team. So if you hire an orchestrator, uh, like there's many composers who don't even own a copy of Sibelius Mm -hmm. because they just hire an orchestrator. So they'll Mm -hmm. give them their Cubase session uh, and a MIDI file, and then the orchestrator will turn it into scores and parts. Uh, But it really depends on personal preference. Some days I'm kind of looking for more of a back and forth workflow, um, which may be more possible, especially with uh, Dorco 4 just coming out. Um, So I think there's a lot of kind of potential in that um, as far as MIDI import options. Um, But I think, again, I'm just sort of making this point because I think it's useful to understand uh, the roles and what, you know, so that you can then kind of scale your workflow a little bit. Um, One thing I mentioned to Brian before we started is I uh, was thinking it might be interesting if if you guys uh, care and would like it for me to put this, uh, to orchestrate it and to put it into notation. Um, So essentially just copy this into notation and I could create kind of a video that shows like a side by side and then you could really see kind of what's going on in the score. Um, and that would be take a little bit of time, but, um, if you guys are interested, um, then that's something I could do too. So, thanks, um, Mike. very generous. Thank you. Lovely. Um, okay. There's a couple of questions that have come in a little bit later that seem to be very popular with the audience. So I'm going to jump to those. Um, yeah, this one, this one surprises me, but, um, I'm often surprised. Um, Nirmal CD asks us, I've had this question for ages and kind of getting mixed response. So the question is, one Q, one project file or entire film, one project file? If it's one the first Q, one of, project if, file. If it's the first of those, how do I keep sync? Um, with time code. So yeah, one, one Q, one project file. Um, I, the reason I wouldn't do, I wouldn't have a whole film with multiple cues in it is, uh, because one, it's huge. Uh, so, you know, try to upload that. And then whenever it crashes and you have to get it back up and running and all that is a huge pain, but also, uh, what happens when you change the tempo in the, you know, third queue, and then it's going to screw up your entire timeline for everything that comes after it. Um, so I don't think that would be helpful or effective. Um, in Cubase, I think Cubase is somewhat better at this, in my opinion, than Logic. Um, but just being able to kind of cut and paste and move the movie file around. Um, so just use time code. Um, so when you're setting up the project, how you keep it in sync. Uh, I mean, in this film, I don't think we have a time code burn in on the film. Um, I'm pretty sure we don't, but you would typically have a time code that is running. So just make sure that time code matches the time code of your project. So for instance, I don't have that at the moment um, because we don't have a time code. So I haven't been concerned about it, but say this is zero, 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 zero. At the moment, that's not what it is in my project. So I need to change that. So then I can just go into, I think it's project setup. Um, and, um, I believe this is it project start time, um, or no, what is it here? It is set time code at cursor. Let me just make this zero and then blah, blah, blah. No, I don't want to move the things around. So now this is in sync with my project. So if I had a time code burn in on this, then now my project matches this. Um, it's good you raise this point because this is very important when you're working with other people. So if I then go to export stems of this project uh, from anywhere, that time code, I need to export broadcast wave files because the time code will be a part of that file's metadata. So that lets me, um, it lets a music editor take my file and then snap it to the time code of the film. So they can drop all their files into a project set them at the uh, original time code, and then they should be lined up. 
So that's what, you know, it's why we all use time code um, because that is sort of the, the clock that everything matches to. Uh, that's a good question. A very good question and an excellent answer. Um, and um, there is unsurprisingly great enthusiasm for your notation offer. So um, yeah, cool. It's very, very popular. Um, won't be tomorrow, but uh, uh, that'll be a fun thing to put together. Okay, cool. Thank you, Mike. Um, all right. All right, here's, here's an interesting one, which I think we haven't covered, but we might have covered in the first masterclass. Matteo Pirovano, uh, when thinking of a theme, would you recommend beginning from the melody or the chord progression? Where do you, what do you usually do? Um, this is a really good question and something that I kind of challenge myself on sometimes. I think for a while I was really, um, I would typically come up with a chord progression first and then kind of make a melody around it. And then I noticed this is what I'm doing all the time. So I would challenge myself to come up with a melody first uh, and then, you know, harmonize different chords under it and try different things. I think these days that tends to work a bit better for me. Um, is thinking more in terms of the melody. I think it's also just because my, um, I don't know, I guess in some way relationship with composition, you know, has uh, kind of changed a little. And I, I tend to think of it more specifically about the intervals that I'm using, uh, you know, and, and kind of how those can work together. So I tend to think a little bit more melodically uh, than maybe I would have a few years ago. Um, but I think, you know, play with both see what works for you, challenge yourself, try to work in a different way. Uh, you know, that's how it pushes us and grows. Okay, great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to find the, you know, I'm doing a little bit of cherry picking on the assumption that we might not have time to go to all of them. Um, all right, uh, this is from Swef, a long time follower of the QTube. Hello, sir. Um, temper changes and keeping in time with bees. Here we go again. Uh, landing on visuals, etc. Do you ignore the grid and the first beats of bars? It gets awkward and maybe some doors handle it better than mine. I don't know which door he's using, but uh, anything you want to say on that? Mike? Sorry, could you say that again? Yeah, sure. Um, temper changes and keeping in time with beats landing on visuals, etc. Do you ignore the grid and the first beats of bars? It gets awkward and maybe some doors handle it better than mine. Uh, I guess short answer, if I'm understanding correctly, uh, no, I don't ignore the grid. I, I make the grid fit so uh, it will land. So um, I will set my hit points. Um, it, it brings up a good topic of discussion. Um, so you can see here in my tempo map, um, let me make this a bit bigger. We'll actually, we'll need this in a sec. Um, you can see in my tempo map, how much, uh, how many changes and with the meter and all that, that I'm, uh, actually doing. I'm first cycling through and sort of finding these in the video. Like, you know, roughly, so I put this little marker around that change, but there's some that I'm kind of being a little bit more particular and less particular about. So this is essentially where the cut is, but it doesn't need to be sort of like a hard hit point because it's sort of flowing and the melody is shifting from the strings to the flute. So that's fine. Um, whereas then more sort of hard cuts like this one kind of around here, I'm altering the tempo to make sure I land there. So I'll set a tempo change here and I'll set one back here. And then I increase this tempo just slightly by four BPM there so that this will hit it at the right time. So essentially, long story short, I make my grid fit the hit points, but you can't work off a grid. Um, you, you can't sort of do things free time. Uh, and, you know, if you want to do anything outside of the DAW, like if you want to orchestrate it, if you want to, you know, send it to anybody to work on, 
uh, then it all has to be on the grid. Even just copying instruments and making sure they're on time together. Um, so uh, yeah, I always have a grid and then I make the grid fit in a musical way. That's the whole purpose of me doing tempo changes and meter changes is I'm doing it to make the grid fit uh, the hit points. Excellent, thank you. Um, and by the way, Mike, um, I'm relaying a message the other way now. Um, Ian Tipping has said, if time is a problem, I'd be happy to put the piece into a notation app. I've done a fair bit and have a bit of time right now. I'd be happy to do the donkey work for you if that would help. That's very generous. Isn't it? Um, join the Discord if you're not on it already and uh, you know, feel free to reach out, get in touch. Uh, it's a very generous offer. Okay, um, lovely. I'll see how I am with time. It's also kind of, I'm because I'm uh, uh, done a lot of orchestration and I'm an orchestrator, I, um, I have fun with it too. Uh -huh. And uh, so could be a, uh, you know, um, what's it called? Uh, okay, or a labor cool. of love. Cool, cool, cool. Um, oh, Swef was happy with that answer, the last one. So thank you for that. Cool. I think just as a sort of last point on that, um, it doesn't have to do with the DAW I'm using. Uh -huh. That's just a general concept. Okay. So even before DAWs, that's exactly what John Williams did with Star Wars, is he had to figure out out of this huge book of, uh, tempos kind of where, you know, okay, I have this many beats and it needs to fit this many frames of film. So what would the tempo be? Uh, you know, and then it'd be 123.765, something like that. Uh, so it's, it's really, I'm just doing the same kind of um, concept, but letting the DAW do the math for me. Uh, excellent. Uh, Ian is responding to your response by saying, <laughs> I should be some sort of international diplomat or something. Um, what's the Discord group? So is there a link to that on your uh, website or where would we find that? Yes, uh, we can also put that link in the uh, description of, the, of this YouTube video. Um, yeah. So that can, that can be up. But yeah, if you just go on my website, it's mikelatticer.com. Mm -hmm. uh, good luck uh, spelling it properly. Um, but I'll put uh, it here into yeah, the chat. yeah, I mean, it'll, it'll be on the title of this film and whatever. Yeah. So just mikelatticer.com. And then at the top, I'll have a tab, uh, here I'll even, I'll even just show you how about that. Wow. So we can make this really, uh, wow. we foolproof. are slick. We are slick here. Um, I'll show you what's on the site. So mikelatticer.com. Here we go. At the top, you can go to study with me. And then here's all about the online course, all that. And then here's a Discord. Click on any of this. I even put the link three times in a paragraph so that it's uh, that many calls to action to just join the Discord. Uh, there's more stuff about Twitch. And then I did this in uh, 2020, this sort of challenge. You could sort of catch up on some of these. This was six weeks where I let people uh, rescore a film that I did and was giving feedback kind of week by week on uh, taking them through that process and all that. Um, so feel free to kind of reach out. You can check out the teachable course here. Uh, you can also go through Brian's link so you can get a discount on that, but that's the best way to find it. Uh, and while you're here, feel free to check out my album. Uh, that was a lot of fun to make. It's all up there. Awesome. All righty. Uh, the questions are still flying in. How are you doing there, Mike? We've done like, um, doing good. we've done a ma marathon. We could have run a marathon by now, for goodness <laughs> sake. Uh, well, perhaps not half marathon. Um, right. Which one shall I pick next out of the hat? Um, oh, this is good. Uh, Mike Br Bridegam again, uh, kind of a tech geek question. Anything that you, Mike, would like to see in Cubase 12? Um, a better video export. That would be great. Actually, I was joking with uh, one of my best mates about this. Stability, please, for God's sake. <laughs> It's still such a finicky and buggy piece of software that crashes, uh, you know, it, like logic is so stable and it just does things and it's video export, uh, logic exports videos that are very small and high quality. Uh, so anyway, those are my main complaints. Like they added this video export feature and it's pretty useless because the video comes out like five gigs or something like that. Uh, so those are my main complaints. You can tell I'm passionate about it. 
Um, but otherwise, uh, no real specifics other than, uh, you know, the, the other big wish list item is make Dorico your notation program. You know, <laughs> this is the goal is to have those completely integrated as one. Um, so anyway, you know, getting there, but, uh, <laughs> that would be amazing to just have a, a one-to-one -one view of your, uh, MIDI. I, I feel like at a point Dorico is just going to become a better DAW as a notation software than Cubase. Uh, so you'll just be able to write completely in Dorico and work with film and all that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Good. That, that one got you, uh, animated. <laughs> um, this is, a, this is a question that's been asked a couple of times, actually, and I think it's a really worthwhile question, which is, what are some of the things that you would recommend for someone who's just starting out in film scoring? Uh, this person has a BA in jazz, piano performance, so there could be people who are quite proficient musicians, but they're interested in getting into film scoring, and they quite feel a little bit overwhelmed. Uh, where would you suggest they sort of, what, what would be those first steps really, do you think? Um, well, honestly, I think just doing it, um, you know, so uh, not, uh, not too on the nose cheeky, but go grab a, a video from the QTube. And it's a great place to start because these are freely available. And uh, one of the best parts about them, in my opinion, is that it's all rights free. So you can go put them on your website. You can start building, you know, a, a real portfolio. And what Absolutely. you can do with, you know, if you've never scored something in your life, try it out, start working. You know, there's you're you guys are luckier now than I was 10 years ago. I was way luckier than 10 years before me. You know, we get more and more resources freely available uh, to be able to do this stuff. So if you can score a couple clips and, you know, post them up in some different forums, like there's a great uh, group teammates uh, that uh, Anne Catherine Dern runs on Facebook and on Discord. Um, I'm going to be encouraging more sort of show and tells in my Discord. Uh, you know, it's a place to get some feedback from other composers. And when you get a couple pieces like that, that you're proud of, then I think the best thing is, you know, go to a film school in your city, you know, or reach out to people, um, you know, online and try to score their short films for free when you're starting, you know, that's uh, a way where then there's no pressure on anyone. Um, and you're just trying to kind of cut your teeth and figure it out and actually work with the director on something. Uh, so, you know, student films are a great place to start. They're figuring out how they're doing it, you know, and I, I scored probably close to a hundred shorts, uh, you know, through school and after, and, um, you know, that really gave me the practice to cut my teeth on it. And then when I was writing additional music on, a, you know, a real primetime series, then, uh, those things, you know, it's sort of like I had the craft, I had all that skill built from that time. Um, so I think the best advice is go do it, um, you know, kind of in short. Um, and there's so many of these resources that you can use, you know, I mean, as a professor at Royal College of Music in Cambridge, I'd be the first to tell someone that they don't need a master's degree in film music. I think it depends on what you need. Um, you know, a master's program like that is uh, for a particular person at a particular stage, you got to really know what you want out of something like that. Um, and all that to say that you can find a lot of great resources outside of sort of a traditional academic route. Um, you know, that's, you know, one of the main reasons I put my course together in the first place is just thinking this could then be shared with so many more people than kind of my single, uh, cohort of, of students. Uh, you know, obviously they're, they're different um, in, in a bunch of ways, but it's sort of giving access in a way to a lot of people that only want, you know, that part of it, who just want to start learning about the craft. All righty. Thank you, Mike. I'm going to be ruthless. I'm going to say one more question and then we're done. Okay. Cool. Otherwise, we're seriously not going to be done. Um, so I'm going to uh, relay the question from Ian Tipping. Um, because he's reiterated it, because uh, I missed it. Sorry, Ian. Um, Good on you for reiterating. Is there any length of theme 
that you recommend? Would you think an extended theme that you can cut down or a melodic fragment more useful? Um, depends on what you need. You know, a short like this, uh, eight bars is all I needed, you know, and, and what I was trying to demonstrate in the first part of the masterclass is that really that eight bar melody, I was able to more or less build the structure of everything out of that. Uh, you know, so my pizzicato stuff came from the first few notes of that melody. My action stuff came from that same melodic idea. So I had that kind of melodic fragment I could pick and pull out of it. Um, so for this, I wouldn't need, you know, like a Mahler 20 bar phrase or something like that, you know, that goes on and on. Um, but for a bigger project that could be really useful I think in general with sort of film and TV, you're probably using sort of shorter snippets of it. Um, so it's probably more rare that you would get to use sort of a full extended 20 bar theme. Um, but, uh, you know, or you could take an eight bar phrase and kind of extend it and go create a B section for that and, you know, kind of go on. So just like you can cut down, you can build onto it. Um, I typically shoot for sort of like an eight bar phrase, you know, that's as sort of like my lead sheet version of my thematic material. All right. Thank you, Mike. And thank you everybody that's, um, made this made this flow so beautifully um you know it's been great to see that you've enjoyed it and it's been great to feel your questions and listen to mike's answers i'm learning uh too so that's that's really great thank you mike for your time and knowledge and generosity my pleasure thank you guys uh said before I, I appreciate that you know you're here and you're interested and i'm happy to share all of this um once again, you can join the Discord. Um, it's a great place to kind of chat. I'm interested in kind of building a bit more of that community there too and creating these things like sort of little show and tells and uh, you know, offering little bits of advice there. It's it's really easy for me to kind of answer some questions, you know, while I'm on my commute or something like that, you know, little bits and pieces. Um, so join that. Um, and you know, of course. If you're interested in the course, uh, you can follow the, Brian will have a link. You can also find it from my website to just check it out. Um, and uh, I've got the first kind of unit up there on themes and suites is there as a free preview. So check it out, see if you're, it's kind of your style. Um, and if you're interested, you get a big discount going through the QTube. And if you do it through January, then you're also supporting the charity partner. Um, so I think it's really win, win, win. Um, I hope to see a bunch of you there. Um, I also do one-to-one -one lessons, kind of as and when. Uh, those can also be purchased through Teachable. Um, so if you're interested in kind of studying one-to-one, -one, uh, we can also set that up. I've got you know sort of limited time to do that. Uh, it's a bit more scarce, but um, there's some availability in that. Um, and really, you know, for me, I love teaching. Um, it's why I am still a professor at the college. Um, and I get a lot out of sharing it. Um, so I really would just want to kind of help people as much as I can. I've been fortunate, uh, you know, and I've worked really hard with the experiences I've had, the opportunities I've been given. Um, and so from that, I've learned quite a lot and I'm happier to kind of pass that on and sort of pass the baton. Like a lot of my mentors have, have helped me. So, um, hope to work with you guys, uh, you know, in various ways there. Brilliant. So yeah, there are various follow up opportunities. I mean, you can post comments, of course, uh, below the video and uh, we, 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 you know, we can harvest those if we do another of these. Uh, there's Mike's Discord group, there's the YouTube Discord group, which is um, full of knowledgeable people. And um, yeah, there's, there's Mike's one to one sessions, Mike's course, of course. Um, so lots of opportunities to kind of follow up from this really. And who knows if we ask nicely, maybe Mike will do another one. So um, yeah, thanks guys. Thank you to everybody. Feeling, feeling good. It's been very enjoyable. So um, good luck to everyone that's taking part in Score Relief. You've still got um, a good couple of weeks to get your pieces of music done. And I hope that this um, has helped you with that as well. So um, yeah. Yeah, I look forward to seeing your works. I don't know if we mentioned explicitly, but I'll, I'll also be on the judging panel for that. Yeah, we uh, haven't mentioned it uh, in this uh, video. So yeah, Mike will be 
one of our fantastic judging panel for score relief. So yeah, there you are. It's all tied together beautifully. All right, thank you, Mike. I wish you a good evening down there in London, down there in the exotic south. And um, yeah, see you, uh, see you cool. next time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now. Figure I'd switch this thing off now. Hang on a second. <laughs> kill, kill. There we go. I think we are.